This is the pre presentation on the implications of maths for public transport business models. I'm going to start speaking and towards the end hand over to John. Can I start by saying our interest in maths has been developing over recent years and is informed by others, especially those involved in rolling out practical maths trials and the research community, particularly ITLS, where we've been involved in a number of projects with mass aspects, including a pilot scheme in Sydney. We offer our thanks to them in helping us develop our intellectual ideas in mass, which we're presenting today. There are very many definitions of mass as we talked about in the discussion document. So it's important to identify the one we're using here. This slide shows the long definition which we've drawn from our book and is adopted for this paper. The important parts of the definition is that it must satisfy three main ele elements. The user must be at the center of the offer. The mobility offers must come from a multimodal offering and the mobility offer must be integrating information, payment and ticketing options. Now our paper is concerned with business models. And again, in terms of definition, this slide highlights the important aspects. In particular, that business models are designed to value add. That mobility markets are complex because of the way in which there may be multiple businesses in the market and that mobility has a spatial aspect that can be used to achieve a competitive advantage. And remember that in this context, the usual criteria for market concentration doesn't include the spatial aspect. The slide also identifies that the shape of the business model critically depends on who the stakeholders are and the organisational arrangements which underpin governance. These are the focus of the next few slides. Although we're not concerned with organisational structures per se, the discussion paper makes clear that the governance arrangements that are in place are intrinsically connected to the business model and hence have to form part of the framework. This slide shows that a mobility framework includes rather a large number of stakeholders. You can see from the list here from operator down to the mass champion. The various aspects of each of these are discussed in the discussion paper, but there are two points that are really worth making at this point. First of all, non-mobility service providers may well become part of public transport operator business model and use their input to cross-subsidise mobility activities. And as this diagram on the bottom right shows, with the, with the yellow circles, public transport operators and public authorities are important to mass. Although this diagram did come from a study which precedes actual mass implementation and which didn't have as a focus, as we'll see later on we should do, with non-mobility service providers. I've already said that the governance aspect is really important and our framework draws on the excuse me whilst I try to get the next slide up. Thank you. Our framework draws on the ITF 2020 and considers four different governance arrangements. So you can see here that there are four different pictures and we've adopted this as a convenient classification. These first three diagrams indicate three levels with the modes at the bottom, aggregators in the middle and the users at the top. In the walled garden diagram, you can see that the platform operators contract with the modes, that's going down, and the user contracts with the platform operator. Typically, this is a closed system with the plat platform operators being private sector commercial operators. The next one, the public mass, the integrator role is either the public authority or the public transport operator. In the regulated utility mass, 
there is still the public authority present regulating the platform providers who in turn here provide services to the user. Meshy mess is not yet proven in a comprehensive way, although there's been a trial in the Netherlands pilot. However, if successful, this organizational form would provide advantages. It relies on a blockchain to process the automatic transactions that occur between users and mobility providers. So you can see here the links within the circle of the messy mesh governance arrangements. We're concerned here with business models. And so this slide looks at the critical aspects of the business model in the mass ecosystem. Of course, understanding costs is important and is the basis for value add. In the mass ecosystem, the aggregator needs to be aware that the different elements that they're involved with will have different cost structures. So for example, train travel is more capital intensive than bus operations. The important aspect, which I guess Dan and Daniel will discuss in more detail tomorrow, is that for mode shifters from private car to mass, it means moving from a low marginal cost mode to a high marginal cost mode, as the full costs of travel are incurred at the point of travel. Understanding the customer, whilst this is part of an earlier discussion, we should note here that there are three elements to understanding the customer perspective, the platform, the payment method, and the service design. And this is discussed in more detail in the document. Importantly too, we must understand the supplier's perspective, and this has been little studied. Although a study from ITLS does show some light on this, and we can just discuss this in more detail if wanted to in the discussion. The highlights of the results from ITLS are that there must be partnership and cooperation on the supply, supply side, and the aggregator integrator is key in this. Underpinned by mode agnostic contracts, which we'll come to in a bit, the business community were more prepared to supply physical assets than investment funds, with car sharing and shared ride being preferred by the non-mobility providers. Enthusiastic government support was identified as more important than direct subsidy. The average preferred equity stake was around about 35%, suggesting that there's no desire to monopolize and perhaps the most important and again something for Dan and Daniel tomorrow is how the aggregators allocate payments from the users to the providers and this takes us to understanding the competing objectives of stakeholders and in particular who are the new market players when you look at business models, you know that there has to be a common goal to be part of the value capture per process. And for this purposes, stakeholders will enter the ecosystem with competing objectives moving towards that common goal. If mass is to contribute to an improvement in the sustainability of cities, then collective transport has to be central to delivery. Much has been made of the interest of ride sourcing companies such as Uber, but the Sydney on-demand pilots have suggested that that's not necessarily the case. Uber withdrew from their initial interest because they weren't willing to forfeit their brand to bus operators, and the bus operators were likely, likewise unwilling to forfeit theirs too. So who might also be in the market other than the public transport operators. And for this, we think there are bikes, e-bikes and car sharing. The question which is central to this is whether or not there is sufficient value in a mass ecosystem for non-mobility operators who seek new opportunities, because this is one way that could be a value add to the mobility offer. The second issue is who is the mass ag aggregator? And clearly this is partly a question of governance, but it has important implications for the business models. Research that we've looked at hasn't come up with a definitive answer. 
Some people argue for a government-led aggregator being in a better position to integrate services, but then it's argued is slow to innovate and may also have a conflict of interest. Non-mobility in operators may be interested. So for example, you might have a utility provider such as an ele electricity board to provide wider packages, perhaps including more than just mobility. The discussion paper discusses the implications for the different organisational forms. Importantly for business models, the walled garden is unlikely to impinge on the public transport operator business model, although their master will now be the aggregator with the government having little influence on the market. So we see here the aggregators having an intermediary point between the modes and the user. In the public mass, the public authority or their appointee would be the aggregator. If mobility contracts follow, public transport operators will need to become innovative about how they deliver the required amount of access and all operators will need to open their APIs and this may require some legislation. In contrast, if we look at the third one here, the regulated utility mass, the public transport operators will have little change to their business model, provided that this third party platform operator behaves like the government, which we believe is likely to be the case as the government will define the rules of engagement. Lastly, Meshi Mass will create considerable change to business models to allow those self-executing contracts between the operator and users. Because if you look carefully, you can see the aggregator is absent from this. So this form, Meshi Mass, along with the other three that we've just looked at, will require some way of allocating revenue as well as some way of introducing subsidy. Turning now to subsidies, aggregators will need to deal with modes which are subsidized and those which are provided by the market. So for example, taxis, Ubers, car share are market provided, whereas public transport as we know it will be subsidized. It seems clear to us that how much the business model needs to change will depend on how mainstream mass will become. The existing models of subsidy as directed here are documented in the discussion paper. And so on the next slide, we turn to the implications of these subsidies. We've divided subsidies into supply side subsidies and demand side subsidies. Taking su supply side subsidies first, these are perhaps the most commonly applied. There are two issues of importance, as you can see here, that are raised in relation to supply side subsidy. Cross subsidy, on the, first, on the one hand, is difficult to eliminate entirely, but in the form of network subsidies where these are given, then the, the public transport manager is effectively making the decision as to which route should run and which shouldn't. And this gives rise to democratic implications because it should be the politicians who decide who should be with public transport or otherwise. And secondly, despite the ongoing movement to more competitively provided services and thus more efficiently directed subsidies, there are still potential issues in the distributional impacts of subsidy. Research shows that supply side subsidies tend to be regressive and to favour rather urban rather than regional services. Turning now to demand side subsidies, these are common in terms of concessional fares, but two other demand side subsidies are potential in a future situation and could be applied in a mass business model for public transport operators. The first, Incentive payments per passenger are really a supply side subsidy because it's given to the operator, but it's based on demand with the subsidy being related to the number of people traveling. 
It can be modified to take account of different cost structures of public transport operations, different length journeys, and also of spatial differences. The second, person-centered payments are true demand-side subsidies and could be targeted to need. Scaling up person-centered subsidies could be done so that they're dealt with within the taxation system, but there could be difficulties if this approach is taken when the responsibility for subsidy is a different government or tier of government from that responsible for collecting taxes. So which is better? Supply side subsidies are either neutral or aggressive, whereas demand side subsidies do better on this criteria. The incentive payment per passenger has some practical advantages, especially now that counting passengers is easy. And these sorts of subsidies would be very appropriate if something like meshy mesh was to become a reality. If we look at the options for subsidy, we, we said on the previous slide that we believe on whether or not mass remains niche or whether it becomes mainstream. If mass becomes niche, or sorry, if mass remains niche, it's difficult to see how the subsidy options will change for the first three models. Contracting can become more incentive based, but it would be difficult to introduce demand side subsidies to replace the existing supply side subsidies. If instead we move towards mode agnostic mobility contracts, then this could be a way that would develop and pave the way for a greater mass more seamlessly, allowing operators to become more proactive at providing trips with different modes. If mass was scaled up, then an incentive payment per passenger could work through the integrator building it into bundles or pay-as-you-go fares. This could be structured so that passengers making more trips could have greater subsidy, providing an incentive for behaviour change. Alternately, a payment for each passenger, a person-centred payment, could be provided to citizens through their, through their tax returns. Both of these would be a way that public transport operators could then operate without subsidy, which in principle could lead to greater efficiency, but require, of course, that they have a good grasp of their costs. This slide then briefly looks at the differences between the different arrangements of governance. In the walled garden, the status quo would work but the risk is a lack of incentive for aggregators to scale up. And of course, in this formulation, there is a constraint to rewarding good behavior in terms of mode shift. For public mass, all aspects of the wall garden would be here too. But if you have a public authority as an aggregator, they could, in addition, provide bulk discounts. But this is inherently involving lower competition, and this in turn could lead to less innovation and a lack of trust, leading to a slowness in the opening of the APIs. For the regulated utility, the presence of additional competition would encourage innovation. And again, because there's public authorities involved, this is the opportunity to introduce bulk discounts. The potential problem here is how do you redistribute the money that the users pay in terms of fares, and there's a risk of regulatory capture. And as with the public mass, APIs need to be shared. Finally, we look more at how much mass there must be for it to be scaled up. And for this, I'm going to turn to John. Okay, John, over to you. So we want to address the question, how much mass must there be for it to be scaled up? And we suggest that scaling up mass has at least three dimensions, a spatial dimension, a quantity dimension, 
and a mobility provider dimension. And this leads us to ask a critical question, what should the thresholds for each of these dimensions be? And we'll be interested in your views on this when we get to the discussion session. From a spatial pers perspective, mass is arguably scaled up when it covers at least a labour market. For example, we might think of Helsinki or the Greater Sydney metropolitan areas. For the quantity dimension, mass can be considered scaled up when it passes some threshold of users and we suggest this must be in excess of 50% of all trips in the spatial area. And mass should certainly be seen as scaled up when all mobility providers are providing services through at least one aggregator, integrator or platform. But how long might this process of scaling up take? Or put it another way, how long should it take? We think that for mass to be scaled up, all of the three dimensions that we've mentioned need to be satisfied. This suggests that a transition will be necessary from the status quo to more demand side subsidies as the scaling up of mass eventuates. And it's also important to note that we expect that this will be context specific, thus adding an additional influence in the transition period. And finally, taking the period in which we've all recently experienced, we think it's important to consider the implications for mass business models and indeed the future roles of public transport and shared mobility in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic. We're all very familiar with what has happened to public transport during the pandemic with dramatic falls in patronage leading to big drops in revenue. And since it's widely argued, and indeed by uh, other presentations, I think, that a strong public transport offer is the backbone of mass, any decline in public transport provision and use has a profound effect on the potential for both mass and the viability of public transport operators. And furthermore, the new normal, despite many references to the contrary, may still be some way off. So this leads us to ask how mass might help drive the recovery of public transport at the current time. There could be a role for mass platforms to facilitate a potential booking system for public transport and to apply different fares and priorities for different categories of traveller. Also, it may be now that the non-mobility components and the non-mobility operators become important in order to preserve the vitality of the mass ecosystem. And as we put it in the paper, it may be more appropriate to talk in terms of multi-service rather than multimodal mass. And without this important development, it's arguable there could indeed be a crisis for mass. And finally, in the context of autonomous vehicles, which were the subject of discussion yesterday, since they represent one of the anticipated developments uh, of future mobility, we should take account of them. But we do point out that there is a COVID-19 dimension here as well, since user perceptions surrounding the safety of sharing smaller vehicles are indeed changing. Uh, this is our final slide. And we thank you for uh, listening to our presentation and we look forward to the questions and discussion.